So what I want to do now is take a look at one of the suttas where the Buddha describes the jhanas and basically take a look at what he says and what I think that means. And this will also give us a chance to take a look at the jhanas 2, 3, and 4 as well. The sutta I'm reading this from is the second of the long discourses, the Samanya Pala Sutta. And it, it's an example of the gradual training. The gradual training is a series of things that the Buddha says that one must do to gradually become liberated. First we have keeping the precepts. I'm sure all of you know about keeping the precepts, all right? Guarding the senses. Meaning, if you see something in a store window, you don't get freaked out and go in and run up your credit card. You just see something in a store window. All right. Uh, mindfulness of daily activities. All of you are always mindful all the time, I hope. Well, it's something to strive for. It's very useful on the path. Being content with little. Of course, if you're a monk, that's food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. As a lay person, we don't get to get by with so little, but basically keeping what you need to keep you alive to a minimum. Then abandoning the hindrances, practicing the jhanas, gaining insight, gaining liberation. And so this is from the jhana part, which comes right after abandoning the hindrances. What access concentration does is enable you to abandon the hindrances. You probably are familiar with the hindrances Wanting, not wanting, too little energy, too much energy, and doubt. Okay? If you're not being distracted, you're not caught up in any of these hindrances. So the generating access concentration is a method for overcoming the hindrances. Then, quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and remains in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining, and filled with rapture and happiness, born of seclusion. Okay, so secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. This refers to the abandoning of the hindrances. The sense pleasures, in particular, is the five senses, and the unwholesome states is the unwholesome states of mind, such as wanting, not wanting, etc. So the hindrances are abandoned, and then one enters and remains in the first jhana, which is accompanied by the Pali words are vitaka and vichara. These often get mistranslated as initial and sustained attention to the meditation subject. In the suttas, vitaka always and only means thinking. It never means initial anything. And vichara generally means something like examining or pondering. Or I think actually in this case, more thinking. So vitaka and vichara, rather than initial and sustained attention, in the suttas really means thinking and more thinking. And it's referring to that background thinking I was mentioning <clears throat> that you experience in access. Remember, at access you're fully with the object of meditation, such as the breath, but there are wispy thoughts in the background. This is what the Vitaka and Vichara refer to. By the time of the Abhidhamma, however, they, they got changed. And I will mention that change in just a moment here. So, secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwhelsome states, one enters and remains in the first jhana, which is with thinking and more thinking and is filled with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion, the piti and sukha. The piti and sukha generated because you've gotten to access concentration and are thereby secluded from the hindrances. Now, you might have heard that these are the factors of the first jhana. You might have heard that the first jhana has five factors. Vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, uh, that's it. There's nothing else mentioned here. 
Not mentioned. Just the four. By the time of the Abhidhamma, they added a fifth factor, one-pointedness, ikagata. But that doesn't show up in the suttas. Actually, it shows up in two suttas, both of which are clearly very late compositions. One of them was probably composed well after, more than 100 years after the Buddha's death. It seems to have been composed after the Second Council, which traditionally is 100 years after the Buddha's death. The other one has a very strong Abhidhamma flavor, and the bit about the five factors doesn't show up in the Chinese version, in the Agamas. So again, it looks like it was composed quite late. There are four factors to the first jhana. In fact, you can't have one-pointedness and background thinking because, duh, you've got the PT and sukha, which is what you're focused on, the PT sukha experience, and you've got the background thinking, so you clearly don't have one-pointedness. As time passed, the definition of the jhanas evolved until by the time of the Abhidhamma, 200 years after the Buddha's death, <coughs> You had jhanas with five factors, but since vitaka and vichara couldn't mean thinking and you have one point in this, they simply changed the definition of vitaka and vichara to mean initial and sustained attention. Now this isn't to say that you don't have initial and sustained attention in the jhanas, you obviously do. It's just that the Buddha didn't talk about that. He talked about the background thinking when he talked about the first jhana. But since they couldn't keep the thinking, they changed the definition of the words the Buddha used. They put new meaning in his mouth and talked about something that was there that wasn't talked about by the Buddha. And then they could throw in their one-pointedness and then they could have their deeper level of jhana. And that continued until the Vasudhimaga, the commentaries, where it got deeper still. So we can actually see the evolution of the jhanas taking place in the way that they're talked about. But the Buddha very clearly is saying, okay, you're secluded from the hindrances, you still got some background thinking, but you got the PT and Sukha going. This is the first jhana. It says, one drenches steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so there is no part of one's entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. I tell students when they're first learning the first jhana, Don't worry so much about getting the PT and Sukha everywhere. For most people, although there are exceptions, when they start experiencing it, the PT Sukha seems to be the upper part of the body, sort of the upper torso and the head. Maybe the spine is involved. This is about about half the people, that's what they would describe. Other people would find that more of the body might be involved. And there are a few people that find the whole body is just right from the get-go involved. But for most people, it's sort of the upper half of the body. The trick is to get into the jhana the first time. And then to get in the second time. And then to get in on a regular basis. And once you get in and you can sustain the experience of PT and Sukha, then you can move it through the rest of the body by simply moving your attention. So let's say you've got the PT and Sukha and it feels like it's just sort of the upper part of the body. All right? Then all you have to do is move your attention from where you're feeling it into your arms. You're, just, you're not trying to move the PT Sukha, you're just moving your attention. All right? And when you do, the PT Sukha will probably follow. And then you can move it into the rest of your torso and when that's stabilized into your legs, okay? And this is what is meant here. So this getting it fully throughout the body is a more advanced practice. First get in, then get in regularly and stabilize that, and then it's fairly easy to learn to move it through the rest of the body. We have a simile here. Suppose a skilled bath attendant (coughs) or his apprentice were to pour soap flakes into a metal basin Sprinkle them with water and knead them into a ball so that the ball of soap flakes would be pervaded by moisture. 
encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture inside and out, and yet would not trickle. In the same way, one drench is steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so there is no part of one's entire body not filled with rapture and happiness. Okay, so we get a picture of what life was like at the time of the Buddha. You didn't go to the store and buy a bar of soap. You got your skilled bath attendant or his apprentice to take a metal basin and then pour in the right amount of soap flakes and then the right amount of water and then mix the soap flakes in the water until it became one homogeneous ball of soap. All right? This is very much like the energetic feel of the first jhana. This mixing of the soap flakes, this is not calm and quiet. This is an activity. This is kind of frenetic. The first jhana has this frenetic sense to it that there's a lot of energy going on here. And the energy penetrates everywhere, which is what the water penetrating the soap flakes is, is symbolizing. So once you're skilled at it, you've got the water throughout your soap flakes, basically. All right? But as I said, that's an advanced practice. First get in, and when you first get in, as I say, it may be an experience of piti sukha as opposed to this is piti, this is sukha. And you need to get in a few times before you can start seeing, oh, this is the physical component and this is the emotional component. The more physical component, the gleeful energy is the PT, and the joy-happiness component is the sukha. Now, it was mentioned about the uh, basically brain chemistry associated with these experiences. In working with some neuroscientists and discussing with them what's going on and what parts of the brain are activated and what neurotransmitters could be involved, my conclusion is that PT is an experience of norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that comes from the breakdown of dopamine. Dopamine comes out of the reward center, which is the nucleus accumbens in the, sort of the center top of your brain. And we see that when I'm in the first couple of jhanas, there's a lot of activity in my nucleus accumbens. So it's probably pumping out the neurotransmitters. And <clears throat> I found enough in the literature about the, act, about the subjective experience of norepinephrine to think, all right, that's what's generating the PT. Dopamine comes out of the nucleus accumbens, it breaks down into norepinephrine, and that's what makes your hair stand on end, gives you that sort of buzzy feeling and so forth. The sukha appears to be opioids, which also come out of the nucleus accumbens. So basically what you're doing when you enter the first jhana is cranking up your nucleus accumbens, your reward center. You're putting your mind into a state where it feels very rewarded, based strictly on the fact that you've gotten secluded from the hindrances. You've gotten to access concentration. And that is a rewarding space to be in. You focus on the pleasure that arises due to the fact that you've abandoned the hindrances, set up a positive feedback loop, which cranks up your nucleus accumbens, generates the neurotransmitters, and off you go to the races. Now this is, this is my current understanding. Um, my neuroscience explanation, I would say, probably has a less likelihood of being exactly correct than my just basically telling you what to do, it'll get you into the jhanas, okay? Because that's based on my experience and the experience of teaching people. But this is my best guess as to what's going on. It's been very interesting working with a neuroscientist and then seeing my brain on jhanas and watching what goes on and then, you know, having sat there and experienced and, and then get a replay of my brain and I can see, oh, I got really active up here and this part got really quiet. It's, it's quite interesting. No, PT is the norepinephrine. Uh, it appear, the sukha appears to be opioids. Probably serotonin, uh, probably endorphins. These are opioids. But we don't know for sure. Uh, you can find out what neurotransmitters are in the bloodstream, 
but that's by taking the blood from some other part of your body, not from your brain. And I'm not really anxious to have them sticking needles in my brain to see what's going on. So, would you volunteer? <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'll teach you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actually quite tricky to find out exactly what's going on in the brain, but you can find out what areas are active. And you can find out, all right, when this is active, this is what goes on. And this is my best guess so far. We'll see. <clears throat> Any other questions on the first jhana? It seems that if you are activating your opioid centers, then starting off with some pain might be okay. Because wouldn't it help you? If you have pain when you start meditating, you can focus on the pain and make it the object, okay? If you can stay focused on it to such an extent that the aversion to the pain goes away, then you can ride that dropping away of the aversion, which is a pleasant sensation, into the first jhana. When you arrive in the first jhana, that flood of opioids is going to help keep the pain at bay, yes. So you've actually got to get there with the pain not quite pushed as far away. But once you get there, the opioids are going to be helpful for keeping it more in the background. <clears throat> and a number of people have reported that when they come out of the jhana, they realize that, oh, wow, actually I was quite uncomfortable then, but I didn't notice it. Part of it is because of the opioids blocking but also because the mind is so focused on something else that is pleasant that, that it's not noticed. So, moving on to the second jhana. So you want to hang out in the first jhana, as I said earlier, if it's really intense for a brief period of time. If it feels like finger in the electrical socket, 30 seconds is probably max. If it just feels kind of intense, but you can stay with it, then yeah, a few minutes. If it's somewhat milder, uh, then you maybe stay five or ten minutes. As to what's going to show up for you, I have no idea. Some people get it very intense the first time, and then don't ever get it that intense again, which they're quite happy about, because it was overly intense. Some people get it rather mild, and then over time it gets stronger. Some people get it medium and then it gets stronger. Who knows? But maintain it <clears throat> for a length of time inversely proportional to the intensity of the experience. All right? And that having been there long enough, one can move on to the second jhana. Further, with the subsiding of thinking and examining, one enters and remains in the second jhana which is accompanied by internal confidence and unification of mind and is without thinking and examining and filled with rapture and happiness born of concentration. <clears throat> okay, so the background thinking, the Vitaka Vichara, subsides. It drops away and it's replaced, well it says here, internal confidence and unification of mind. Inner tranquility and unification of mind is a more accurate translation. Because the thinking is dropped away, now the mind can become unified. Okay? You don't get the ikagata that's mentioned in the commentaries, the one point in this, but you do get unification of mind. The mind becomes unified around the experience of piti and sukha. But notice it's also inner tranquility. For anyone who's experienced strong piti, the word tranquility doesn't come to their mind to describe the experience. What's necessary is to calm down the piti. In the first jhana, the piti predominates and the sukhas in the background. In order to move to the second jhana, take a deep breath. Remember I said don't take a deep breath when you're trying to get to the jhanas because it'll block the piti. Now you want to calm down the piti. So you take the deep breath, really let it out. And when you do, the piti will come down in intensity. The sukha will a bit as well. But now you've done a foreground, background shift. 
and the suka is in the foreground and the piti is in the background. <clears throat> Put your attention on the suka, the sense of joy or happiness, and let the piti remain in the background. In the first jhana, the piti is pretty intense. You know, you have this tension, maybe you're vibrating, maybe your hair standing on end, maybe you get a flush of heat. You take the breath, things calm down, and now you're focused on just being happy. Just happy. So the PT is more like some maybe some rocking or swaying, maybe some circles, something like that. So there's, there's a sense of things aren't quite still, but it's very calm as opposed to very tense and excited. And your focus of attention now is on the emotional state of joy or happiness, however the sukha manifests for you. <clears throat> the happiness, well, it's, it's the happiness like it's your birthday and somebody gives you a really nice present and you open it up and you're like, oh, wow, this is so nice. I always wanted one of these. This is it great? That kind of happiness. Only it's being generated by your concentrated mind as opposed to something external to you. Okay, so it's the same feeling, but it's now called sukha because it's an internally generated thing rather than something generated on the basis of an external experience. But also, I, I mean, isn't that also the sukha is kind of more of a, I, I feel it in kind of a somewhat sensory uh, differentiation of the body in a sense. So I feel like the piti is like this, huge, and then sukha becomes much more and it's much subtler in terms of body sensation. That's yeah. how mm -hmm. I kind of distinguish it. That's how I kind of get into it. I don't know. Yeah. That is a right. I would say that the body sensation that you're feeling is the leftover PT. Okay? Because remember, there's both PT and sukha in the second jhana. It's the sukha is predominating. The emotional sense is predominating. But there's still a leftover sense of the body feeling pleasant. Okay, and I would say that that's the PT. Okay, so <clears throat> it's yeah, it's a much, it's a richer, calmer state is the best way I could put it. Uh, it doesn't have the buzzy, high pitched feel to it. It's uh, it's more of a rich chocolate rather than that cheap s stuff from the store. <laughs> Yeah, and it's more subtle. But the good news is, having been in the first jhana, you've increased your level of concentration, so hopefully you can stay with a much more subtle object. This is the whole idea all along. You're continually moving to more and more subtle objects, but continually increasing the level of your concentration, and hence your ability to stay focused on a subtle object. So again, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by this rapture and happiness. <clears throat> if the first jhana seems to be centered more in the face area, the second jhana seems to be more in the heart area. It's like the sukha is coming out of the heart. Right? And it may feel that only the torso and head are involved in the second jhana. Again, one can, when one has gotten skilled at it, move one's attention into the extremities and in so doing make, the, make it seem as though the PT and Sukha is now pervading the whole body. We have a simile again. Suppose there were a deep lake whose waters welled up from below. It would have no inlet for water from the east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain. Yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse the whole lake so there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool water. In the same way, one drenches, steep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration so there is no part of one's body not filled with rapture and happiness. So we have a lake far up in the mountains, no streams coming in, no rain, but a spring at the bottom of the lake. And the water from the spring totally permeates the lake, totally fills the lake. 
This is an incredibly accurate picture of what the second jhana feels like. There's this spring, most people say in the heart center, uh, and out of the spring comes sukha. And you're just filled with this joy, happiness. It's just upwelling. It's just a really nice feeling. In the first jhana, when it hits, you might have a big grin, you know, teeth showing the whole thing. It's like, wow. In the second jhana, it's probably a big smile. You know, when it's really strong, it's one of those break-your-face smiles. Maybe nobody sees your teeth, but you're, you've got this big grin on your face, and you're just happy for no reason other than you cranked up your nucleus accumbens, <laughs> just pumping out the neurotransmitters to make yourself happy. Can you maintain that state? If so, that's the second jhana. And as I say, there might be some sort of rocking or swaying in the background because you are still got a little bit of the norepinephrine in your system, but things have calmed down and you're just happy to be in the second jhana and you hang out with it. And as I say, this simile is, the first time I heard it, I was struck by, wow, that's, that's, that's exactly what it feels like because I had already been practicing the second jhana. And it is right on. I mean, this is what you're aiming for, is this upwelling of happiness that just maintains as long as you keep your focus on the happiness. In the first jhana, the piti sukha is your object. The breath is gone. The breath was what got you to access. It's like you come home, you got your key, right? You open the door, you go in. Do you walk around with the key in your hand? Are you making supper, holding on to the key? You watching TV with the key in? No, you put the key, you let it go, right? It did its job. Same thing with the breath or the metta or anything else. Get to access, let go of the key, focus on the pleasant sensation. Takes you to PT Sukha. Now focus on the PT Sukha experience. Hang out there first, Jhana. Take the deep breath, calm the PT, focus on the Sukha. Now that's your focus. It seems strange that once you get focus on the breath, the first thing I'm telling you is, okay, now that you're good with the breath, don't focus on the breath. But that's just how it goes, all right? There is a tendency in the second jhana to want to pay attention to the breath. Ignore the breath to the best of your ability and just hang out with the happiness. Just be with the happiness. And it'll, it'll come up, it'll get a little stronger, and then it'll get a little weaker, and then it'll get a little stronger again. It's not steady, right? It's like that spring, you know, it comes up a little stronger, and then it weakens, and then it's back. But it's all together a rather all-encompassing, happy experience. So, once you're skilled at entering the second jhana, you want to be able to maintain it for 10 to 15 minutes. There's no problem with staying too long here. The first jhana, yeah, after 10 minutes, you've had enough at any level of PT. At the second jhana, yeah, just keep hanging out. It's really quite pleasant, just as long as you want to be there. There are advantages to hanging out for a long time. There's a very interesting book called uh, Destructive Emotions by Daniel Goleman which is uh, basically a description of a meeting with some neuroscientists, psychologists, psychiatrists with uh, the Dalai Lama. And one of the things it points out in there is that if you are having negative emotions, there's more activity in your right prefrontal cortex. If you're having positive emotions, like PT and Sukha, there's more activity in the left prefrontal cortex. Well, we can see this with EEG and with fMRI when I'm in the jhanas. There's noticeably more activity in the left prefrontal cortex, the positive emotions. Furthermore, everybody has an emotional set point, the place where they're just going to hang out most likely. And furthermore, you can move your emotional set point more to the positive by simply hanging out in positive emotional states. You can move it more to the negative by hanging out in negative emotional states. Hanging out in the second jhana is a positive emotional state, and so you tend to 
over time, we're talking years here, move your emotional set point more towards the positive. So hanging out in the second jhana over time has an overall positive effect on your emotional state. But <clears throat> hanging out each time you do it generates more concentration, which means that eventually, further, with the fading away of rapture, one dwells in equ equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus one enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. So the move to the third jhana is the piti goes away and the sukha remains. It also mentions that one dwells in equanimity, mindful, and clearly comprehending. Uh, the sense of, yeah, this is nice, this is a good place to be, is that equanimity that's coming. It's not totally emotionally neutral because of the sukha, but it's an equanimous place, it's an even-minded place. And it's certainly quite easy to be mindful and clearly comprehend what's going on because of the level of concentration that's happened. So basically the move from the second jhana to the third jhana is to get the PT calmed down. So you've been hanging out in the second jhana for 10 to 15 minutes. You want to move to the third jhana. You might guess if you want to get the PT to calm down, take a breath, right? So you take a, you don't need as big a breath now, but you take a breath and let things calm. When you do that, the PT should calm completely and furthermore, you want to take the sukha from happiness or joy down to contentment. It says one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. Happy equanimity could be said to be contentment, wishlessness, uh, a state of satisfaction so complete that if Mick Jagger had been practicing the third jhana, he wouldn't be able to sing that song. Right? You've got satisfaction, all-pervasive satisfaction. Right? And because the pt has gone, it's very still. There's no more rocking or swaying, no more sense of energy. You're just satisfied, just contented. I said you could take a breath to get the pt to calm. At the same time, let the intensity level of the sukha, the happiness, calm down towards contentment. It may be helpful if you can remember a time when you were very contented. Uh, I don't know, you just eaten the perfect meal, you didn't overeat, and you don't have to wash the dishes, right? Remember the feeling. Don't get caught up in asking for recipes, all right? Like a quarter second memory and pluck the feeling of contentment out of it. Okay, so you're in the second jhana, you got PT and sukha, you take the breath, things start calming, you remember the contented feeling, and now you let the sukha become the contented feeling, and now you're focused on contentment. And you get stabilized in that sense of contentment, and then you check, make sure the PT's all gone, and then you just give yourself to that contented feeling. It's a very nice place to hang out because you, you don't want anything. You've got everything you could possibly want. <clears throat> Again, one drenches steep, saturates and suffuses one's body with a happiness free from rapture, so there's no part of one's entire body not suffused by this happiness. Okay, so there's a sense of dropping down once more. If the second jhana seem to be heart-centered, the third jhana may be down to the belly. In fact, the sense of going down from one to two to three is so strong that if a student tells me they went up to a jhana, I don't know whether they meant up from two to three or up from two to one. The, the sense of the jhanas going down overrides the numerical sense of the numbers going up. It's that strong. So you're going down from the high first to the second to the third down to a place of still 
in that there's no PT and still very positive in that you're very contented and you're just hanging out there. And <clears throat> if it's not all pervasive, you move your attention into the extremities and then you can move it on through. But again, this is an advanced practice. You want to get good at staying with the contented feeling. You've got to maintain the contentment and maintain your focus on it. So it's going to take some practice. But once you're stabilized with that, then you can move it into the entire body. It's not, not hard at all once you've got it stabilized. Does the hearing drop away at some point? The hearing drops away dependent upon the level of your concentration. If your concentration is enormously good at access concentration, your hearing may drop away there. If your concentration is not all that great, but you're at the fourth jhana, your hearing may not drop away there. So it's more a function of the level of concentration than the objects of concentration, the objects being these very jhanic states. However, of course, as you move through the jhanas, you deepen your level of concentration, which tends to take you in the direction where your hearing will drop either down or away. Often people find that it doesn't drop away, but everything seems further away. Uh, and if you're really skilled at it, generating deep concentration, yeah, the hearing drops out completely. I'd say don't particularly think about, okay, now I've got to move from the heart to the belly or anything like that. It's more focus on the emotional experience. Yeah. And you'll notice that, oh, yeah, it shifted. Okay? If you start focusing on the body at this point, you're lacking the focus on the emotional experience, which is what you need. And so it, it basically becomes a bit of a distraction. Having said that, this is the general rule. You may find for yourself that it actually helps to move, to look at, at the parts of the body. I tell the students on my retreats, learning the jhanas is trial and error. Actually, it's trial and error and error and error and error until you finally get it. So it's a lot of experimentation. So even after you hit access concentration, it can take a number of sittings before you begin to figure out, okay, this is what I do, and this is how I do it. Uh, and a lot of it is sort of stumbling around until you figure out what works. But I would say go more with focus on, on the emotional experience as you move from one to two to three to four. I would say that it begins in the second, but it's, it's not that great. By the time of the third, yeah, you've actually generated uh, enough concentration that it's going to be noticeably enhancing your insight practice if you come out of the third jhana and start doing insight practice. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, it, this is very different, of which the noble ones declare one dwells happily with mindfulness and equanimity. It's, that doesn't show up in any of the others. I have no idea. Remember, all of this sort of came into this formula by pulling the bits and pieces that showed up in various places in the suttas, and whatever oral tradition didn't get preserved in the suttas, and so maybe at some point the Buddha made some comment to someone about, yeah, the noble ones really say that this third jhana is, that's the beginning of the good stuff. This is where one has, one dwells happily with this equanimity and mindfulness. And so somebody remembers that and, it, you know, I'm just speculating here. So I wouldn't make any big difference. Just use the, the hint that it gives you that this is what you're aiming at. Now it seems appropriate. Uh, 
when in the first uh, John Island you're saying that the back or second going to the second John the so called background thinking drops away. Mm -hmm. I would say that if you've got as much concentration as the Buddha had, now remember this is a guy practicing meditation every day, probably eight hours a day or more. Uh, when you hit the second jhana, it probably gets pretty quiet. If you're a Westerner living in 21st century Western civilization, probably not going to get as quiet because you're probably not going to be as concentrated. But the thinking tends to get much quieter. In other words, there's the background thinking of access concentration. And that remains in the first jhana. And now as you move to the second, there's much more of the mind coalescing around the experience of, PT, of sukha. But there's still a little wavering. We could say by definition you're beginning to lose it and you're getting it right back. Okay, You could do better than this but you're probably going to need to go on a month-long retreat to get better than this. And probably even in a 10-day retreat, you're not going to get to where it really gets quiet. And then in the third jhana, yeah, <clears throat> again, it's probably not going to get totally quiet back there, given that you're coming from a busy life. On a long retreat, yeah. And the, the gaps between the thoughts might get noticeably longer. In other words, you're there and you're like, yeah, oh, this is really contented. And then you're just contented for five, twenty seconds, something like that, and then it's like, yeah, I wonder how long I should stay here. And then the mind's quiet again for five seconds. Oh, never mind. <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff. But the tendency to wander off into, yeah, when I get out of here, I've got to turn the TV on quick and watch the World Series. Nah. That's only going to come up for me because I'm from San Francisco. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Can you say something about access to the dhammas in the process of walking, meditation, or yeah. sitting? When you're doing walking meditation, you can probably generate, or some people can probably generate enough concentration that it would be access concentration if they were to stop. But when you're walking, you've got to pay attention to where you're going. Right? So you don't have quite the one-pointedness necessary for it to be access concentration. But I have had students who felt they were really concentrated when they were doing walking meditation, and they just stopped and closed their eyes and went into the first jhana. So you can get there, but probably not really in the jhana while doing the walking meditation, just because you've got to pay attention to where you're going. So we have a simile here. Suppose in a lotus pond there were blue, white, or red lotuses that had been born in the water, grow in the water, and never rise up above the water, but flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots, they would be drenched, deep, saturated, and suffused with water, so there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with water. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with a happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's entire body not filled with happiness. Okay, so the simile is a lotus pond with lotuses coming up out of the mud, but not above the surface of the water. They're just filled with water. And this is a very still picture, right? We don't have lotuses waving in the breeze. They're just underwater here. That sense of underwater is some of that feeling of isolation that's beginning to kick in. You're a bit away from the world around you. And so this is, again, a, a hint at what's going on. And that sense of just being completely pervaded with contentment. And it's a very still and unmoving state is also captured in this. Again, a very good simile for the experience. That for the That's for the third jhana. And when you said earlier that just pay attention to the emotional experience of each of them, mm -hmm. this is my question since I'm not sure I have access to concentration, but what, what is the, can you say more about the emotional experience of equanimity and... 
pay attention in the first jhana to the piti sukha experience. Pay attention in the second to the sukha happiness experience. Pay attention to the sukha contentment experience in the third. Don't worry about all the rest of the words. Yeah, what you'll notice is that you, you come out of the third and you go, well, yeah, this is a much quieter place than two. I mean, two was really quite nice compared to one, which was a little too busy. But three, oh, yeah, it's like just happy to be here. Just, yeah, the mind is very even. And you'll notice all this in retrospect. If you start trying to do that analysis while you're in the jhana, you'll lose the jhana. Yeah, so... It's more about measuring in retrospect with the writing to see did your experience match what was being described than trying to do it while you're in the state. Now, that's my take on it. You will meet other teachers who would say otherwise. Okay? Bhante Ji and Tanisaro Bhikkhu in particular. But, you know, I'm reading what it says here. So... (laughs) Right. Possibly. Uh, After we finish these and take a break, I'll describe the higher jhanas, which you don't have a sense of the body. And so perhaps one of the jhanas that I describe at that time may remind you of the experience you had. Uh, I would need to know more about the experience, but let me give you the possibilities, and then we can see what happened. But people do fall into these states out of order. In other words, they go on the three-month course at IMS, and they're sitting there, and they find themselves in the third jhana, just completely contented without ever experiencing any PT, or in the seventh jhana without ever experiencing any of the previous six. So this does happen. Because they're naturally occurring states, if your mind is quiet enough and it turns towards something that's a bit like the jhana, it tends to go into that jhana. So this is what happens. They're Correct. It's easiest if you do that because the first gives you enough concentration that makes it easy to find the second and stay with it. And then if you can do that, then you've got enough concentration to find the third, which is even more subtle, and stay with it. Etc. But the states are essentially independent from each other. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. If the PT is too much, and particularly if the PT is too much and the sukha is weak, it's quite irritating. Yeah, but even for people where the PT is strong and they've still got good sukha, they may find, ah, I've had enough of this, right quickly. The purpose of the first jhana is to get you to the second jhana. And so if you get into the first and the PT is too much, it's irritating, and there's some sukha there, then take the deep breath, calm the piti, and focus on the sukha, and go directly, almost, go go quickly into the second jhana. Well, it's the same sort of feeling that you would get if you get a really nice present. Or somebody says, oh, that paper you wrote was fantastic. I learned so much from reading it. Or, you know, something nice happened to you and you were just like, wow, yeah. Right, yeah. It may have a physical component to it, but that's the PT part that's still left over in the second. That PT might? Yes. If you are subject to some form of seizure, 
I would say PT is probably contraindicated. I don't know. Uh, if you feel that the PT might not be good, don't go there. All right. It's, it, 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 you can start with the second jhana. In other words, you can get to the access concentration and slide off into the happiness without generating the PT. This is possible. Some people, this happens automatically. In other words, they don't get the PT or they get very little PT, but they get the sukha and they just go straight into the second jhana. People doing metta find that it goes more often into the second jhana than into the first. Okay, so it is possible to learn to go straight into the second jhana. But you may not know what the second jhana is without first going into the first jhana and then finding the second and then having an easier time of going directly into the second. So it's tricky, uh, but it can be done. And I have had a number of students that just found the, the, the PT of the first jhana to be too much, and so they just bypassed it and went for the second jhana. Right. So, uh, my experience is that oh, I can either amplify or de amplify. So, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, it's not a real thing, but it's a kind of a soft wish, kind of open wish. <laughs> so, I can actually do control how much PT I want or not. Yeah. So, I don't, is that your experience? Because that, yeah. I think you can really, if mm-hmm. you keep going back and forth, you can actually learn how to right. amplify or de amplify the experience. Yeah, you can. You can get enough skills so you can have any level you want. All right? Yeah. In fact, one of the things I teach students is get into the first, crank the PT up as high as you can, bring it down, bring it back up, make it go away completely, bring it back. You know, and when you got that, you've got some control over it. But even when you've got that control, you may find that, yeah, but it's still, it's it's just too much even when it's weak. I much prefer the others. Yeah. <laughs> and so you go on to the second or third pretty quickly. Yeah. I'm just trying to get a handle on the PT because it seems sort of like what's good for it. I mean, we talk more about what it, where it's a challenge. What it's good for is that if you can generate the PT, you can probably, as a side effect, generate the sukha. All right? So, in other words, generating the PT brings the sukha along. Now you calm down the PT, work with the sukha. Now you get rid of the PT, work with the sukha, and you're in the third jhana. So it's like <clears throat> you're turning on your nucleus accumbens, and it's going to start pumping its neurotransmitters. Some of those neurotransmitters are going to be PT, and some are going to be sukha. You really want the sukha stuff, but in order to get it, what you're doing is you're pumping the PT out, and it brings the sukha with it. That seems to be what the strategy is. When you're skilled at it, you can go for the sukha directly and just you know, get a minor amount of PT or none at all. What's the relationship between uh, PT and uh, what's referred to variously as prana or um, kundalini? They seem to be the same thing. It also seems to be the same as the Tibetan Tumo energy, the mystic heat. You know, the Tibetans would go meditate in the dead of winter, chop a hole in the ice, dip a sheet in, wrap it around somebody, see how many sheets they can dry in one night. All right? You're generating a lot of heat. Good thing to know in Tibet in the wintertime, right? It seems to be the same energy as PT and as Kundalini. It's used differently in those cases. And for the Tumo practice, it's being manifested as heat. And women apparently are much better at Tumo practice than men. Maybe that's not surprising to the women. Uh, The Kundalini energy is used differently. I don't know enough about Kundalini yoga to know how they use it. 
it's used in jhana practice basically as a way to bring up the sukha and then it's calmed down. And then you use the sukha to get yourself concentrated enough to get deeply, deeply concentrated for insight practice. Most people learn to control it. If, if you're having trouble with it, then the thing is to get it going, crank it up as high as you can, bring it down. Crank it up again, bring it down. Learn to, to control the intensity, and then bring it up really high, and then shut it off, and then bring it back. And those, that sort of learning of what to do with your mind. Then when you go to move to the third, you should be able to turn it off. Okay, moving right along. Having hung out in the third jhana for 10 to 15 minutes, got it nice and stabilized on the sense of contentment. Further, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, one enters and remains in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. Okay. So the fourth jhana is reached by abandoning pleasure and pain. Now, this doesn't mean there's pain in any of the jhanas. And it says, with the previous passing away of joy and grief, there's no grief in the jhanas. What's being pointed to is the neutral state of mind. So you're abandoning pleasure but not picking up pain. You're going to neutral. You have abandoned joy. Remember, joy was present in the first two. All right, and now you're contented in the third, so it's the previous passing away of joy, but it didn't go into grief, it just went into neutral. So the fourth jhana is a neutral state of mind, emotionally neutral, not pleasant, not unpleasant, not joy, not grief. And one enters and remains in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful, very equanimous, and contains mindfulness, fully purified by equanimity. Okay, so in the third jhana, the contented feeling is pleasant. It's nice to be contented. It's a little wispy Buddha smile. It's not the big grin or, or even the big smile or anything. It's just the wispy Buddha smile. I find that I can shift my attention to the smile and relax all the muscles in my face. And when I do, there's a sense of things starting to sink down. It's like, and then I just go with that sense of sinking and let it keep sinking. Sinking towards a place of quiet stillness. The letting go of the smile brought me to the neither pleasant nor unpleasant, to the equanimous place. And it also started this sense of sinking. And just stay with the sense of sinking and let it sink to quiet stillness. The object of the fourth jhana could be said to be equanimity, but that's a little hard, a little nebulous to focus on. Easier to say the object of the fourth jhana is quiet stillness. Put your attention on the sense of quiet stillness. The sinking feeling may go on for some time, but it should bottom out at some point. And you're just there in this very emotionally neutral place, very quiet, very still. <clears throat> Ayakema, my teacher, talked about in the third jhana, you're sitting in the mouth of a well. You're a bit isolated from the world around you. Okay? And then to get to the fourth jhana, let go and drop down the well. The fourth jhana requires more letting go than in the previous jhanas. And what you've got to let go of is everything you're hanging on to. Just let go and drop. Now the dropping is not really fast. It's more of a drifting. It's more like sinking to the bottom of the swimming pool. All right. Um, don't try and climb down the well. You got to let go and just drop down the well. But it's it's a it's a drifting down. And then eventually it just stops drifting, and you find yourself in a place of quiet stillness that is emotionally neutral. 
It says, one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind, so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. Well, when I first started getting to the, what I thought was the fourth jhana, it was dark. It was like black, dark, you know. And I, I go to Ayakema and I describe what I'm getting, and she says, yeah, that's, that's the fourth jhana. Now, I didn't know about this description, so I assumed the fourth jhana was dark. It was only much later that I learned the description, and pure, bright mind. Pure, okay, I can see that. I mean, the mind is so quiet that it's pure, but bright? Uh, I didn't get it. <laughs> it was just like, well, okay, this is a definitely a quieter state, and it's more concentrated, and Aya says it's the fourth jhana, I'm just going to keep doing it and leave it in the I don't know. I don't know is really important on the spiritual path, because mostly we don't know. All right, so you need to be comfortable with I don't know. So I don't know. There's a simile. Suppose a man were to be sitting covered from the head down by a white cloth so there would be no part of his entire body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind so there is no part of one's entire body not suffused by the pure, bright mind. Okay, the picture is pretty clear. Some guy's got a white sheet over his head which completely covers his body. Okay, uh, the sheet is sort of isolation from the world around you. I get that. But why is it a white sheet? I mean, I don't get it. And I didn't get it for years. I mean, I'm practicing the fourth jhana, and I'm getting this dark, quiet space. And I can go from there to the fifth, sixth, etc. So, okay. Then I went on retreat with the Venerable Pau Auk in 2006. This was a month-long retreat. And he put me to work doing... Uh, he said three to four hour sittings. Okay, so I would count my breaths, counting the gap between the out breath and the in breath for half an hour, and then I would shift to just being with the breath. And what started happening, I started getting very intense PT. I mean, it was so intense, I was afraid my head was going to pop off. And so I go to the next interview with Powalk, and I describe, I didn't use the word PT, I just getting all this energy and so forth. And he says to me, that is gross PT, do not let that happen. Okay. Uh, so I've got to figure out how to not let the PT happen. Well, remember I told you to smile when you meditate. So I've been used to smiling when I meditate. So I discovered I had to keep a very solemn expression on my face. And if I kept the solemn expression, then the PT didn't come. You know, and I could just be there with the breath. Half an hour of counting. Another two hours, two and a half hours. I'm sitting in a chair, so you know it's doable. Just being with the breath, trying to get to his jhana, trying to get his nimitta, his circle of light. Not happening. Okay, but sometimes, sometimes I'd done, you know, his three hours, three and a half hours, and I'd smile. And here comes the PT. I mean, you know, it was like going to pop, pop my head off. And I would quickly take the very deep breath and calm it down, and boom, I'm in the second jhana. There is no doubt this is the second jhana, just like I'd been experiencing for all those years, what I came and taught me, only it's really stable. I mean, I got the break your face grin, I'm as happy as I could be, and my mind is not going to go anywhere. It's just staying there. It was very nice. I was like, wow, cool. So after about 10 minutes, it's like, let's go to the third jhana. Oh, and during that time, I'm, I'm there, and the PT would come back, you know. You know, think, you know. More and more time between it. So after 10 minutes, I'm like, all right, let's go to the third jhana. Couldn't go to the third jhana. You know, try and calm it down, and the PT would come back. Nothing to do but just hang out in the second jhana. I, it calmed down and then it would come right back. I was like, okay. You know, I like being happy. I can hang out here for a while. <laughs> After about 20, 25 minutes, all of a sudden, it just like goes over the edge. I didn't do anything. But just the happiness calmed down to contentment. 
and the PT didn't come back. And I'm clearly in the third jhana, in a much more profound state than I'd ever experienced before. I mean, I had just done three hours in access concentration. I'd gotten really concentrated. And now when I'm in the third jhana, it's just like, there. And I sit there being content for quite a while, and then it's like, okay, let's go to the fourth jhana. Can't get the contentment to go away. It just feels too contented. You know, I'm just, I'm along for the ride. And then eventually at some point, it just sort of goes over the edge and drops off into the fourth jhana. And I'm in this place of quiet stillness. But there was a difference. It is now bright white. It is totally white. It's just like if I were sitting in the middle of an open field on a bright sunny day with a white sheet over my head and my eyes open. Just like the simile. And I finally got what was talked about. Clearly the Buddha was practicing at a level of concentration more akin to what I was experiencing with the three hours in access than what I'd been used to doing with ten minutes in access. All right? And so now I was hitting the depth of jhana that more clearly matched the description given here in the suttas. It was, well, it was eye-opening, to say the least. It was really nice to hang out there. And once again, you know, just hang out there. And after 10 or 15 minutes, it was like, okay, see if I can do some insight practice. But I was so tired from having sat for that long that my insight practice was kind of weak. It was only later when I sat with Powak again last summer that I was able to actually do the insight practice in the post jhanic state. And it was, well, it was quite insightful, I must admit. Yeah, let me do what comes next, and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so what comes next is, when one's mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs and inclines it to knowing and seeing. One understands thus, this is my body, having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. The purpose of the jhanas is to generate a mind that is concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, which you direct and incline to knowing and seeing, to doing an insight practice. And what sort of insight practice? This is my body, made of the four elements, composed of material form, born of mother and father, fed on rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, which is bound up with it and supported by it. You might have heard of the four foundations of mindfulness, right? First foundation, body. Second foundation, Vedna, that's mine. Third foundation, mind states, that's mine. Fourth foundation, phenomena, that's mine. The jhanas are a warm-up exercise for insight practice for investigating body and mind. Basically, the jhanas are a warm-up practice for the four foundations of mindfulness. So there's the answer to your question. Do a practice based on the four foundations of mindfulness. You mentioned the body scan practice. <laughs> Investigate the body. Do the body scan after you've been in the jhanas. It's going to be really different than before you get into the jhanas. Do the four element practice. Elements are mentioned here. Elements are one of the practices that's given in the Four Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta. So basically, investigate reality. In particular, investigate your body and investigate your mind. And as the Satipatthana Sutta says, one does it internally and externally. So investigate other bodies and other minds. 
And in particular, the Satipatthana Sutta says investigate them in terms of impermanence. Notice the arising and the passing. We have impermanence mentioned here. So <clears throat> the insight practices that are appropriate after being in jhanas are practices that enable you to investigate reality, to investigate in particular mind and body and their impermanent nature. Normally, when we sit down to do our insight practice, we bring our ego with us. And so your insight practice is done from an egocentric perspective. We basically approach the world, can I eat that or will that eat me? Well, we get a little more sophisticated than that, but basically it's, is this something I wanna get or is this something I gotta push away? All right. That's, this is how we're interacting with the world. Although it appears that the world revolves around me, it turns out not to be the case. It would be much easier to see the world as it is if you look from a non-egocentric perspective. It's not possible to move through these four jhanas and have your ego running loose in the normal way. You have gotten so quiet that basically you've said to your ego, sit down, shut up, get back to you later. And so when you come out with that clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy mind, you have a mind that's not so egocentric and you're able to look at the world from a less egocentric perspective. And because of this attained to imperturbability nature of your mind, you can look at the impermanent nature of the world and not get so freaked out. They talk about the dark night of the soul on the spiritual path. You do need to see that the world is actually not giving you security, not giving you perfect satisfaction, not giving you eternal pleasure. In fact, that you aren't even really there, right? Having that imperturbability that's been generated by moving through the four jhanas and having that less egocentric perspective enables you to see deeply into the nature of reality, the impermanent anicca, the unsatisfactory dukkha, and the empty anatta nature of reality. These are the insights you want that are too, truly transformative. Getting enlightened is a difficult thing to do. If I wanted to cut this table in two and I had a butter knife, I could probably do it. It's going to be hard work. You know, I could, you know, it'd take a lot of persistence. But if I got a whetstone and I started sharpening up that knife and then I started cutting, it's going to go a lot faster. Jhana practice is sharpening your mind, okay? You still got to go out and do the cutting, and your butter knife's going to get dull, and you're going to have to come back and get it sharp again and keep going. In the Tibetan tradition, the bodhisattva of wisdom is Manjushri. Manjushri is often depicted as having a sword that he uses to cut through the bonds of ignorance. Jhana practice is simply sharpening Manjushri's sword. Okay, you haven't cut any bonds of ignorance. You still got to go out and wield the sword. And you certainly don't want to just sit there and sharpen. Because if you do that long enough, of course, the sword disappears. Right? You put the edge on it, you get concentrated, and then you go do your insight practice to see what's going on. Questions? learn the jhanas, and then go experiment. What I found for myself was that probably an hour in access concentration to an hour and a half in access concentration, 
and then jhana practice for half an hour and then insight practice seem to be the best. That's a three-hour sitting, okay? That a 45-minute sitting, no, no way to get deep enough and have any time left to work. To try and stay longer in access concentration, yeah, I got deeper jhanas, but when I came out, I was tired. I needed to pee, you know. It's like I'd used up all of the energy that I had, so I'd pass the point of diminishing returns. So for myself, I find about an hour in access, and then step through the jhanas in about a half an hour, and then do insight practice seems to be the best. But you're going to have to fool with what works for you. And that's going to be dependent upon how well you know the jhanas and how comfortably you can sit. I mean, if you're going to do a three-hour sitting and for the last two hours you're fighting your body, that was useless. Better to have just done an hour sit and get some insight practice in with whatever concentration you got, say, in the first half hour. So it's really a matter of your physical condition for sitting long sits to determine how long is going to be an appropriate length of time. And then I would say using no more than half of that time for concentration. The latter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think he thought I was exaggerating when I said my head was going to pop off. I wasn't exaggerating. <laughs> it was the most intense PT I've ever experienced. Thankfully, I've never had it again as strong as I did on that retreat. Even when I sat with Powalk again under similar circumstances and built even deeper access concentration, I didn't get the PT that strong. I haven't had what you describe. What I had. Yeah, I mean, afterwards, so after I had to lay down to rest a little on my side, and then my body kind of. Yeah, I've had after students. Effect. I've had students report that. I've not had that myself. Okay. So after the effects, so yeah. Right. I would guess that it's leftover PT. This seems to be what happens. You work with the PT, and you calm it down, and okay. But there's still a little bit left there, okay? And so, which suddenly comes back, and you've got something like that going on. At the beginning, but it doesn't happen. Right, and that seems to be the case. Yeah, at the very beginning when I was doing lots of hours and hours. Yeah. And now I just don't have Yeah. It seems to be the, the case that when you first start learning the jhanas, you get, shall we say, leftover side effects. <laughs> right, and then as you get more skilled at it, it just doesn't happen anymore. Those would be momentary PT. The commentaries talk about five flavors of PT. Minor PT, okay, you just, you're sitting there and you start rocking, right, and it's sustained, so that's minor, but it's not real thing. Momentary, where you get like a shiver or a jerk or something like that. Okay, so it's there and it's gone. There's showering PT, which you get a burst of PT and it goes away, and then you get another burst of PT and it goes away. All right, so the things you're describing coming back on a sort of regular basis, but not sustaining. Then there's uplifting PT, which makes you sit up really straight, makes your hair stand on end, and according to the commentaries, will make you levitate. <coughs> Although I've had students report that they thought they were levitating, nobody ever actually did. And then the fifth type is all pervasive PT, full blown PT, which is what I'm talking about for the first jhana. Yeah, where you got it, you sustain it, and you can control it. This is energy. Energy, yeah. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some people never get the momentary PT. Some people get it occasionally. Some people get it regularly. Okay? To work with the jhanas, you need to get past it and get the sustained PT. So if you're getting it regularly, it's just a matter of persevering and trying not to let it ups- upset your increasing focus, and then you switch to the pleasant sensation, and hopefully the full-blown PT comes at that point, although you might get a few more bursts of the, of the momentary. Right. Because at this point in my practice, I thought it was kind of chaotic in that respect. Right. As you're describing it, it seems so organized, and I guess one or two. But it doesn't seem like that. Right. Yeah. It doesn't really happen that way to everyone. There are people that it happens exactly that way. It happened pretty much that way to me. Okay? Uh, it's like a template. It's like a template. And it's like the white line down the middle of the road, but some people are over on the right and some people are over on the left. So what I describe is like, all right, here's the instructions. Go try it out. Tell me what happens when you have an interview. And then we try and work with what your personal experience is. Yeah. So I give these instructions like right at the beginning of the retreat so people have an idea of what they're supposed to be working with. And then hopefully during the course of 10 days or two weeks or a month, we figure out how to do it. Good. Yeah, that's that's what I was hoping to do today. Yeah, I can't say, no, that's wrong. Yeah, it's, it's the name for an experience that you'll get if you have sufficient concentration and then you focus on something pleasant. And so... Well, we do, because the holy rollers and people talking in tongues, they're, they're getting PT, right? So all of these spiritual things where people got lots of energy that just goes out of control, all of that is PT, but it's not being channeled in the same way as what is being worked with the jhanas. So it does show up in the West, but it doesn't show up in the average Westerner's experience, Although it can, you know, people can, can get really excited and become hysterical. Right. Yeah, it, it, the difference between hysteria and PT is PT is under control. You know, hysteria has a lot of similarities. Uh, it can have a lot of similarities to PT, but because it's out of control, it's not useful. So, but I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't worry that if you start trying to learn the first jhana, you're going to break out in hysterical laughter. You know, I've had over a thousand students, I imagine, and nobody's busted out in hysterical laughter. I have had a few people giggle, though. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, meta practice would produce oxytocin. I don't know if where it would come into the jhanas or if it does. Yeah, what I know about is the activity of the nucleus accumbens, and I don't think oxytocin comes from there, but I don't know. But yeah, oxytocin is another neurotransmitter that 
particularly if you start heartfelt love will generate oxytocin. In fact, the heartfelt love, what you're feeling is the oxytocin. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't know if it would be involved. Uh, second jhana has some sense of that, but it's more, it's more of an opioid thing of like, than, than, than a love thing. What you describe probably isn't jhanic, but probably is a side effect of getting more settled. Okay, so you come in at this level, and you get more settled, but you suddenly get a back up to that level, and now it feels very agitated. Okay, and now you're, it, here it comes. It's not even as high as it was when you came in, but, but the contrast. So as you're settling, you don't settle like this. You settle like this. And so I would guess that it's, as you get settled, then there are times when it becomes unsettled. And it, it, feels, it feels very agitated compared to where you were. It's a little different. It's, it's, it's getting very quiet, but there's also an insecurity issue. I, hear, I, mm-hmm. I get songs in my head. Yeah, yeah. So straight, I, I describe Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that can be just, you know, you've got stuff in your system, now you've got quiet enough that it just comes up, right? Uh, this is enormously common. Yeah, so I would guess that it's probably that latter part. Yeah. Every time you get up, you, you don't go back to zero. But if you've built it up to 100, I found getting up to go pee, that was it. Just mindfully walking down the hall, peeing, coming back to my room where I was meditating, I dropped it down to about 25. It didn't go to zero, and I could get back in, but I couldn't get back to 100 again. Well, at least not before supper was ready. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> The three-hour sits are generally on long retreats. I mean, at home, uh, no. It's 45 minutes or an hour. So, but on a long retreat, I would, do, I would try and do the long sits just because I found that that was helpful. But this is only a recent thing in my career. For many years, an hour to an hour and a half was the max I would ever do. Okay? Uh, until 2006, the longest sit I'd ever done was two hours. Okay, and I'd been practicing jhanas for, what, 16 years at that point. And I had gotten a lot of deep insight into the nature of reality and into what the Buddha was talking about. So it's possible, even doing just 45-minute sittings, if you do them well, to get concentrated in the first half and do insight in the second half and gain enough insight that is actually transformative. So... If it feels like three hours is too much, no, no worries. Do what you can. I mean, an hour is going to be considerably better than 45 minutes. And if you can pump it up to an hour and a half, yeah, that would be good. But for many years, I would go on retreat. You know, they do 45-minute sitting, 45-minute walking. I just sit through the walking period. They ring the bell for the next sitting. I jump, go pee, come back, do another hour and a half. And that worked great. I don't like walking meditation, so it was doubly yeah. great. <laughs> Have you all meditated sitting in a chair? No. I learned the jhanas sitting cross-legged on the floor in 90. And in 94, my bad knee started hyperextending. And I thought, I shouldn't sit cross-legged for a while. Uh, 94 was a long time ago. <laughs> The last time I sat cross-legged, which was in 02, 
my knee hurt for six weeks afterwards, and that was for 25 minutes. So I decided that mm, I don't think I'm going to sit cross-legged anymore. Do I ever have problems falling asleep? Falling asleep? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I much prefer sitting on the floor. Uh, do I have trouble falling asleep? Not usually more than once or twice a day. <laughs> I mean, while meditating. Yeah, no, I have trouble falling asleep. I mean, I have trouble in that I do fall asleep when I meditate, if I'm sleepy. I mean, I don't know if anybody was peeking before lunch, but, you know, my head actually did hit the mic at one point. (laughs) It woke me up. (laughs) So, yeah. No, I much preferred sitting on the floor. Um, It felt more stable. It felt more alert. It felt more comfortable. I just can't do it anymore. Certainly aim for access concentration. Uh, I would say spend half of your 45 minutes or an hour working on concentration and half of it doing insight practice. That's for everybody, no matter what their insight practice is, no matter what their skill level at concentration is. If you're going to want to learn the jhanas, you're probably going to have to go on retreat. I do have a few students who learn them off retreat, but they generally tend to be people who are sitting usually three to five hours a day rather than 45 minutes a day. Uh, so it's, it's quite difficult to learn them at home. Occasionally, people who've had a long-term practice and sit an hour every day and been doing that for years can learn a, a few of the jhanas at home. But that's, again, very, very rare. Uh, unless you're in that less than 1% that can learn them at home, Yeah, you're going to need a 10-day or longer retreat. Um, Yeah, I Mm-hmm. So yeah. Kind of a lot of well. Yeah. On those long sits, sits at the forest refuge with Powak, a lot of them were lying down. Yeah. I didn't lie flat. I put enough pillows so I was, I, I, was, I had my legs up and I was sort of at an angle, not flat, but sort of at an angle, and that helped keep me awake. And I did occasionally fall asleep doing that too. But yeah, so lying down works. That helped me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the best place I ever meditated, without a doubt, nothing else comes close, was in a samadhi tank, an isolation tank, you know. There was no body dukkha. It was just like you forget about your body, it's just you and your mind. The jhanas were like so easy and so strong. It was wonderful. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether we are, but we're definitely in a good space. Yeah. Well, the spacing out, you just got to be diligent like you do when you're sitting up. The falling asleep is pull your knees up, okay, so that you're not lying flat. So you've got your knees up. I, it's, I have them sort of in a triangle like this, okay? And as I said, I had enough pillows so I wasn't lying totally flat. But even then, I mean, I'm more likely to fall asleep (coughs) lying lying down than I am sitting up. Yeah. Yeah, at first when I tried to meditate lying down, it was it was pretty hopeless. It just didn't work. But I wanted to do longer sittings. And the easiest way to do a really long sitting and not have my body 
bother me was lying down, so I just kept practicing it. I would do it like once a day, and all the rest were sitting in a chair. And eventually it got to where it was working. So I don't have any tricks, yeah, other than the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Yeah. There is a sutta that says that it is possible to come out of any of the jhanas and become fully enlightened. All right, if you gain enough insight. Um, Ayakema said, I don't know so much about the first sutta, but it does say that in the suttas. I mean, the first jhana. Okay. My take on it is that that sutta is probably a later composition. All right, that you really got to come out and do insight practice what you might attain is going to be strictly dependent upon the depth of the insight. The depth of the insight is going to be to some degree dependent on the depth of your concentration and to some degree on the vigor with which you investigate one of the three characteristics would be how I would phrase it. So... It goes back to its usual dependent on what I'm doing. If I have pretty nice life and I'm never driving in rush hour traffic and so forth, then yeah, it stays for a while. I get back and I'm, you know, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. It goes back to... Yeah, but I have pretty good concentration. I mean, you know, I was a computer programmer. I did it because it was easy and fun because I could concentrate. So... It, it goes back to not retreat level, but it's still pretty good. Uh, probably my level of concentration these days is better than it would be at this age had I never practiced meditation. In other words, I probably have a better level of concentration. I'm just saying those intense retreats, like the conditions of those intense retreats. Yeah, they wear off. Yeah, it's definitely different. Uh, I haven't been anywhere near the level of concentration that I was at last summer since, well, since the retreat. I was in for nine and a half months, and when it ended in February, you know, it just began tailing off. Some of the effects have remained. I'm a little more patient than I used to be. That's been kind of nice. Uh... I'm even worse at multitasking than I used to be. It was pretty bad to begin with, but it's, you know, it's slightly worse than it was then. It's no big deal. You know, so I have noticed some, some sort of permanent effects from the nine and a half months. But the concentration level, yeah, it went pretty much back to normal. Good normal. The, the insights stick around. Yeah, if you have an insight, keep it fresh. Keep bringing it to mind. If you don't keep bringing them to mind, they go back there with your high school Spanish. You know, you get the insight again, and you go, oh, yeah, I knew that. I forgot. Just like you go to Mexico. Oh, yeah, I knew that word. I forgot. All right? So keep them fresh. Keep, keep paying attention to the fact that everything is impermanent, that nothing is satisfactory, that everything is empty, in whatever way it manifested as an insight. Uh huh. Um, but it also that also feels tense. I don't know if that tension is that natural part of it or is that yeah, okay. yeah. The, the tension that comes with the PT, <clears throat> it'll straighten your spine. It'll produce a bit of tension. It'll once it starts coming good, it'll mess up your breath to where your breathing kind of <sighs> weird. Uh, it can make your hair stand on end. It can make you vibrate. It can like be a rush of heat. All of these are possibilities. The tension is pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't mess with what's bringing it on. Hopefully there's enough sukha with it so that the overall experience will continue to be pleasant. 
But yeah, uh, I mean, when PT comes on, it can be very much like stick your finger in the electrical socket. Like, ah, too much. Uh, if it's really strong, that is, you get the thing fully there, and it's really strong, then you can move on to the second jhana within five or ten seconds. Uh, and I'll talk about moving between jhanas after lunch. But yeah, you don't need to stay in the really intense PT for very long. Um, if it's mild, then you can stay, hang out for five or ten minutes. If it's getting a little bit much, you might hang out for a minute or two. And if it's too much, yeah, it might be on. I generally stay in the first jhana about 30 seconds at most. Yeah, if you're used to meditating with your eyes open, it may be easier to work with doing what you're used to. Uh, I've had a few Zen students who were used to practicing with their eyes open. Uh, I remember one of them turning his cushion facing the wall like he'd done his whole life, and then he was able to get into the jhana. So yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Right. You want to generate good access concentration and then move your attention to the pleasantness. The pleasant sensation, either localized or general, may show up before you've been at access concentration very long. Ignore it until you've gotten the access concentration built. The most common problem that students encounter is what I call jumping too soon. It's like, I followed three breaths in a row, here's a smile, let's go. And it just doesn't work. Um, so let the access concentration build. Leave that whole body pleasantness there in the background. Although I say focus in a specific place, there is a significant minority of people that find that it's just an overall general feeling of pleasantness and they can focus on that and that'll take them into the first jhana as well. So count it lucky that you've got the pleasant sensation, let the access continue for a while and then switch to it. Don't switch to the pleasant immediately. Get the good access first. Good, good. Yeah, it's very much get the access concentration. Now find the pleasant, even though the pleasant may have showed up earlier. Yeah. Yeah.
So in terms of slot control for adjustments, I take deeper breaths. So I was just wondering, I had the question arise, well, yeah. how do I block this one? <clears throat> right. One of the things that's necessary is to have energy and concentration in balance. The Buddha talks about this specifically. If you have too much energy and not enough concentration, well, obviously you're just sitting there buzzing. If you have too much concentration and not enough energy to balance it, yeah, you fall asleep. And that's tricky. Uh, <clears throat> you want to get your energy up, obviously, rather than bring your concentration level down. And the things that I wound up, wind up telling people to do on a re retreat is get enough sleep. I mean, <laughs> leading 21st century Western civilization lives, we are always sleep deprived. So come on retreat, and your body finally goes, ah, she stopped, I can sleep, right? So generally at the start of a retreat, a lot of people are dealing with sloth and torpor. About 40% of the students come in and report it. And it lasts usually about three days. And so it's a matter of just get caught up on your sleep. Sleep in in the morning if you have to, take a nap after lunch, you know, these sort of things. Uh, sometimes what's helpful is go for a brisk walk. So you're sitting here and you're falling asleep, there's not much you can do at, at that point. It's like, all right, I don't have the energy to do jhana concentration. Open the eyes to stay awake and do some sort of insight practice. But on a retreat, you go for a brisk walk, that'll sometimes get your energy up. And another strategy that's talked about in the commentaries is to basically deal with sleepiness if it's a long-term problem is eat less food. I mean, you go on retreat, only excitement you got is eating, right? And there's a tendency to overeat. If you can actually leave the table just slightly hungry, that'll definitely help keep you awake. So on retreat, you know, don't eat as much food. But yeah, when you're sitting here and you're finding yourself sleepy, it's like if you continue to try and deepen your concentration, what you're really doing is deepening your tendency to fall asleep. Well, I was, I could, when I took deep breaths, I would wake myself. I mean, I didn't yeah. have more energy, so, but I was playing with that sense of not right. trying to take a bigger breath, to like keep following my breath as opposed to... And yeah, and, and the, it may be necessary, you've got to take the deeper breaths to stay awake. Yeah, well, to, to stay awake, because, yeah, yeah. Be right, but it, else. right, and it, realizing that taking the deeper breaths may prevent you from getting the concentration level necessary to enter the jhana. It's just that's the way your system is right now. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I find for myself when I go on retreat that you know, I don't drink much caffeine. I mean, I'm one of those weird people who doesn't do coffee or tea, but I'll drink green tea on retreat if I'm sleepy. Uh, you know, modest amount, and it, it definitely helps. Good. Oh, good. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's certainly taking you in the right direction. And even if you don't learn the jhanas, if you learn getting to access concentration, hanging out a bit, and then starting your usual insight practice, it will enhance your insight practice. Yeah. <clears throat> a concentrated mind, uh, an indistractable mind, to whatever degree you have, is going to help with your insight practice. Guaranteed. Working with metta. If you're going to use metta as the access method, then do the metta practice for at least half an hour. And there's not really any good signs like, you know, the breath getting shallow. The diffuse might, white light might come, maybe. But often with the metta, there's enough activity that it, that doesn't happen. So you do the metta for half an hour. And if it feels like, yeah, you're really able to stay with the feeling during the latter part of that half hour, then there's the possibility you've generated access concentration. <clears throat> One, you could go directly to probably the heart center where there's going to be a nice warm glow, see if you can stay with that feeling, and it take you to the jhana. That would be the sort of direct strategy. The other one would be to then go to the breath and see what it's like with the breath. And if the breath feels really quiet, then go to the pleasant sensation, which hopefully would still be in the heart center. The first time I entered the jhanas with metta, uh, I had probably done, it was an hour sitting, so I'd probably done 45 or 50 minutes of metta. And it was, it was a good metta sitting. I mean, the feeling was really strong and everything. And the moment I turned my attention to the pleasant feeling, it was just like, boom, there was the jhana. Now, I was already skilled at the jhanas, but... <clears throat> once you've gotten quiet with the metta and are really feeling it towards the various groups of people you're sending it to, that's access concentration. And then just turn your attention to the... Let go of the phrases or the visualization or whatever you're using. Turn towards the pleasant sensation and see if it'll take you there. And be patient. Because, again, when you're learning this... You may be exactly where you need to be and you're with the pleasant sensation and nothing's happening and just stay with it and stay with it and then it gets a little stronger and then until it finally takes off. Yeah, access concentration basically is you're not getting lost. All right, so you're fully with the object of meditation, the breath or the metta feeling. And if there are thoughts, they're not causing you to lose your attention on the object, the metta or the breath or the body scan or whatever. So you're fully with the object of meditation. And if there are thoughts, they're in the background and not pulling you away. Right. Yeah, you're not counting or visualizing or anything like that, right? Yeah. Often if you use one of those aids, when you drop it, it feels like you've regressed, but that's okay. So you count it, it's really settled. This is like access with counting. You drop the counting, oh, I lost my access. Don't worry, just stay with the breath, it'll come back. Yeah. In general, better to focus on one. But the Buddha was the most practical person that ever lived. Whatever works. Okay, so if you find a system that works that takes you to the jhanas, use the system that works that takes you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say that it's going to be, I mean, we're looking for one-pointed concentration. So if you've got one thing to focus on, you're more likely to get one-pointed concentration. But whatever works. Okay, last one, then we go to lunch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Three, four, five, six days. Yeah. So people go on retreat. It was funny. I start when I first started teaching. You know, it's a ten day retreat, and it's now five days in, and nobody's learned any jhanas. Well, nobody's gotten to access concentration sufficiently yet to get there. So people don't start learning the jhanas until the last half of the retreat. They're spending the first half of the retreat getting settled. So that's an average. Uh, some people, yeah, they really need a month-long retreat, and it takes them like two weeks. Um, some people come in because they've got such a good daily practice. They sit down, bang, they're there, second day. So it, this this long... You know, I mean, it's you know the, your your standard bell curve, and most people fall in the three to four to five days, and I would say the four to five days is probably average for people to to get stable access concentration, and then it's another day or so before they got stable access concentration and figure the trick to get into the jhana. So yeah, it's coming in for the weekend and. Uh, not likely to get there, but some people will. Some people, access is, almost everybody can get to access concentration in a 10-day retreat. I mean, that's well over 90%. But it takes, it takes days for most people. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are eight jhanas, and there are four additional states. In the suttas, they're simply referred to as the four immaterial states. You have four jhanas and four immaterial states, but they often go in a sequence, and so it makes sense to refer to them as the eight jhanas. There is actually one sutta where that construct occurs, and in the Abhidhamma and after that, they're referred to like that. They're known as the immaterial absorptions, Remember in the first ones, it says one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the PT and sukha. So there's body awareness in the first four. But for the higher ones, these are immaterial in that there's no body awareness. The first four are also material in the sense that here in the material world, we have experienced rapture, happiness, contentment, quiet stillness. So they're not unfamiliar experiences. The experiences of the four higher jhanas are quite different from anything we experience in the material world, so that's another good reason to call them immaterial jhanas. I'll read you what it says. By passing entirely beyond bodily sensations, by the disappearance of all sense of resistance, and by non-attraction to the perception of diversity, seeing that space is limitless, one reaches and remains in the realm of limitless space. Okay, so this jhana has a name, the realm of limitless space. It's actually translated here as the sphere of infinite space. But sphere maybe gives you a sense of something round. No. And infinite, well, at the time of the Buddha, they didn't have the concept of zero yet, so I don't think they had the concept of infinite, but they did have the concept of boundless or limitless. So the realm of limitless space. And it, notice it starts out by passing entirely beyond bodily sensations. So you need to generate sufficient concentration that you're no longer going to be paying attention to your body. And then it says, by the disappearance of all sense of resistance and by non-attraction to the perception of diversity, seeing that space is limitless, one enters and remains in the realm of limitless space, which, until you've done it, doesn't make any sense. 
What Ayakima told me after I got skilled enough with the fourth jhana was come up out of the fourth jhana. In the fourth jhana, you may find your energy is slow. You're sort of stooped over, which means if you're peeking and you see somebody sort of slumped over, don't think they're asleep. Think how nice they're in the fourth jhana, right? <laughs> Unless they're snoring, of course, <laughs> right? <laughs> so bring your energy up. And then Aya said, get in touch with the boundaries of my being and then expand them to fill the room and then expand them to fill the building and then the retreat center and then Manhattan and then New York and just keep expanding out to the horizon and beyond and keep going. The expansion should probably be done in a direction you can move your arms symmetrically so out to the sides or in front of you or most people find up and out to be the best. Okay, not in all directions, that's too busy. Just pick two directions and expand. And just keep focused on that sense of outward expansion. It doesn't matter what you expand. I have said the boundaries of my being. I've had a student who took a, an imaginary balloon and blew it up until it popped. Uh, she followed a beam of light. Okay, anything that can get your mind going further and further and further and further away, this outward expansion. If you can stay focused on that, eventually a vast, infinite space will appear before you. That's the fifth jhana. Put your attention on that spaciousness. Don't look for the space while you're doing the expansion because if you're looking for the space, you're not focused on the expansion and the fifth jhana won't happen. Just stay focused on the outward expansion. The jhana will come and find you, just like the first jhana. Stay focused on the pleasant sensation. The jhana will come and find you. When the jhana arrives, it's usually dramatic enough that you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, this is something different. And it's a huge space. Just put your attention on that spaciousness. If you're a visual person, you'll probably see the space. It may appear as sort of an off-white or a light gray, just sort of going on and on forever. Or it might appear as black, like outer space, but no stars or galaxies or anything. It says, by non-attraction to the perception of diversity. When you first start the expansion, there's your body and the room and the building and Manhattan and New York and, right? When you get to the horizon, just keep going. Don't go to the moon and Mars and Jupiter. Just expand. And so when you hit that infinite space, it doesn't have anything in it. It's just big. And there's a tiny sense of an observer observing this vast space. Keep your attention on the spaciousness. That's the fifth jhana. When you get good at it, that is, you can maintain it for 5, 10, 15 minutes. By passing entirely beyond the realm of limitless space, seeing that consciousness is limitless, one reaches and remains in the realm of limitless consciousness. The instructions are getting a bit sparse. <laughs> okay, so you're aware of this limitless space. Shift your attention from the space to your awareness of the space. Become conscious of your consciousness of the space. It's a sort of a shift from what's out there to your observing the observing of what's out there. It's, it's a subtle shift, and when you do, if you do it correctly, there's a sense of you becoming absorbed into the space and becoming this limitless consciousness. Your mind just got very big. Okay, your mind is now as big as that consciousness. You can't have been observing, or you're as, as big as that space was. You can't have been observing a limitless space 
with a limited consciousness. Your consciousness has to be as big as the space. And so when you begin observing your consciousness, it's really big and you just absorb into the space and become this limitless consciousness. <clears throat> if it's really strong, it may seem as though there are other consciousnesses within that consciousness. A few little consciousness here, a few little over there. This has got to be a good six jhana. I've only had it happen maybe probably less than a dozen times. And I've been in the six jhana a lot more than a dozen times. Okay, but when it's really good, you may get that sense. It's not like you can read the minds of anybody else in the room or anything like that. It's just the sense that you have. There are people who practice a spiritual tradition where the goal of the tradition is merging with Atman or the ultimate or something like that. And they perhaps would misunderstand this six jhana as having arrived at the goal of the practice. I mean, if you become a limitless consciousness, then you're there, right? No. You're having an experience that you interpret as you are a limitless consciousness. I don't think you're actually tapping into any sort of external infinite consciousness or anything like that. You're having an experience and your attempt to identify what the experience is to sanya, to use the Pali word, to perceive what it is, you come up with, oh, I am a limitless consciousness. Okay, I am an infinite consciousness. But I don't personally think that you're tapping into anything external. Other people would disagree with me. Okay, so you have to decide for yourself. Go have the experience and then you can have better stuff to work with. As I say, at first, the shift is pretty subtle. As you get more skilled at it, though, you do start to see that this is actually quite different from the infinite space. Hang out there again, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and then, by passing entirely beyond the realm of limitless consciousness, seeing that there is no thing, one reaches and remains in the realm of no thingness nothingness, no hyphen thingness. This is, well, it's like the void. There's nothing. When you're in this limit, when you are this limitless consciousness, you can shift your attention to the content of that consciousness. Well, it turns out that consciousness has no content. The sense of space is long gone after you've stabilized for 5, 10, 15 minutes, and you realize there's nothing it's conscious of. Put your attention on that nothing. At first, you'll probably get a small nothing. It's okay, keep your attention on the nothing. As you do, you'll notice there's nothing over here, and there's nothing over there, and there's nothing back there, and there's nothing back over there, and, and it gets to be a big nothing. <clears throat> it doesn't have that infinite, limitless feel. It's just, there's nothing. The nothing is not the same as emptiness. I'll talk some about emptiness tomorrow. But the nothing is like, well, you look around this room and you see chairs and cushions and people and lamps and Buddha statues and flowers. Let's say that tonight while we're gone, somebody comes in and takes everything out. And you come in in the morning and you open the door and there's nothing here. That's the nothing, right? There's a cookie jar and you take the top off and you put your hand in and there's nothing in it. That kind of nothing. Nothing at all can be found. People who stumble into this state, say on the three-month course at IMS, feel like they've fallen into the void. They generally tend to get quite freaked out. And they go running to the teacher, and the teacher gets them calmed down and tells them to take a shower and get something to eat and maybe don't meditate for a few days. They just fell into the seventh jhana. I know this because they later come on retreat with me and they come to their first interview and they say, can, can I tell you about something that happened? And I say, sure. And they describe falling into the void on the three-month course and so forth. And I say, well, sounds like you fell into the seventh jhana. Oh, I don't know what it was, but it was really scary. And I say, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. 
And so then they go off and they learn the first few jhanas and then eventually they get to number six and they come in and uh, this is probably a couple of retreats later. And uh, I say, okay, here are the instructions for seven. I'm not sure I want to go back there. <laughs> no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And so I give them the instructions and they go and they come back three days later and they're like, yeah, yeah, this was it. This is exactly where I was before, only this time it wasn't scary. The fear arose because they didn't know what it was. There's actually nothing to be afraid of because there's nothing, right? It's just nothing. It's a great place to hang out. There's nothing to disturb you. Again, if you're visual, you'll probably see it. It'll be one of two things. It'll either be very dark, like black, deep purple, dark blue, or it might possibly show up well, I've never seen this, but students describe it to me. You know how if you turn your TV to where there's not a channel, you get the black and white static? Okay, imagine black and black static. All right, so you're, you're there and you're just seeing black and black static. That's another way that the seventh jhana can manifest. There's nothing there, right? It's just static, all right? People generally tend to get either the static or the dark color of nothing if, they, if they're getting it visually. Again, hang out there for an extended period of time and then you can move on to the eighth jhana. And by passing entirely beyond the realm of no thingness, one reaches and remains in the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. Perception is a translation of the Pali word sanya. <clears throat> sanya means the ability to name things. Lamp, Buddha, flowers, bell, person, okay? And so this word sanya is part of our perception ability. First there's the contact, the light striking the eye, and then the vedna, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and then the identification. So like, can people see a tree? Can you see the tree here? Everybody see a tree? There's no tree. The tree is in your mind. There's black and white shapes. That's all. Your mind makes the tree, all right? Your mind does this with everything it sees. You only see colored shapes. The fact that you see person here is because you see these colored shapes, you look them up in your database of potential objects, and you think it's person, all right? Same thing with a sound. Your sound, your, with sound, your ear only hears sound. Your mind says truck or jet plane or whatever, okay? So this sanya, this perception, is the ability to identify things. And the eighth jhana is the state of neither identifying nor not identifying, neither naming nor not naming. Uh, that probably didn't help a lot. <laughs> it's a pretty subtle state. The best I can tell you, it's a state that has no characteristics by which you can identify it, yet you know your mind is in a state that has no characteristics by which you can identify it. Okay, that's the best I can do. The good news is, if you're skilled at seven, it's fairly easy to find eight. If you're skilled at seven, you got a big nothing. Let the nothing collapse and come to rest in front of your face and see if your mind is then in a state that is stable that you can't describe. It's probably eight. It's a much more subtle state than any of the previous ones. In the previous ones, say the third jhana, you've got your contentment and you've got your one-pointed focus on the contentment. You could actually start to lose it and start thinking. Contentment's going to start fading away, but if you get back, there it is. You know, so you might, whoop, whoop, you might do that repeatedly. You might even in the seventh jhana, you've got nothing in your one-pointedness. And you start to slip off a bit, but get back before the nothing disappears. In the eighth jhana, <clears throat> you might have time for one simple sentence, provided that sentence doesn't contain the words I, me, or mine. It's a really subtle state. I cannot tell you the number of times I've been there firmly in the eighth jhana, 
and then find myself in the middle of a paragraph about something like, how did I get here? And there's no trace of the eighth jhana. It's just completely gone. I have to go back to seven or five and work my way back up to it. So it's a very subtle state. All of these states generate a mind that is even more concentrated, even clearer, sharper, brighter, more malleable, more wieldy, more imperturbable than coming out of the fourth. So there are ways of deepening the concentration, the indistractability that you generated with the first four jhanas. And again, they're most useful coming out of them and starting to do insight practice. When you come out of eight, your mind is so quiet that it's not, it's not useful for an insight practice that has any activity associated with it. It's fairly good for what they call choiceless awareness, for those of you who are familiar with that particular technique. But if you were, say, going to contemplate something like, well, the Buddha says every day you should contemplate your aging, sickness, and death, if you come out of the eighth jhana and start trying to do that contemplation, you're like, uh, uh, you know, you're just so quiet. Better to go back to seven and then come out of seven and contemplate aging, sickness, and death. Something that's a bit more verbal, shall we say. But if it's a nonverbal meditation, then you could come out of eight and do it. So all of the jhana's primary purpose is to generate a mind that is maximally suited for insight practice. The first ones have positive side effect of activating the right prefrontal cortex, or the left prefrontal cortex where the positive emotions are, and thereby moving your emotional set point over. But that's a long-term, multi-year project. So these are the eight jhanas. There is another state that is sometimes referred to as the ninth jhana, although not in the suttas. This is later referenced that way. It's referred to in the suttas as the cessation of feeling and perception. Naroda Vedana Sanya, sometimes just called Naroda. It's a state of suspended animation, a state where you're completely unaware of anything. Not your mind, not your body, not your breath, not sounds, nothing. You're just, it's like being in deep dreamless sleep. You're gone. It's not particularly useful. Well, maybe if you have a root canal coming or something, it might be useful if you could enter that. But uh, otherwise, the only use that I have heard of it is when you come back from it, you can watch yourself reassemble your sense of self because it's gone away and when you come back you can sort of watch yourself reconstruct yourself and that can be insightful. Um, it's about all I can tell you about it other than there's a documentary on the Kumbh Maya festival. It's a festival they have in India every 12 years. I believe they're having it this year. Uh, <clears throat> last one, I think something like 20 million people came. Makes Woodstock look like a backyard picnic. And the documentary is called Shortcut to Enlightenment, or maybe it's Shortcut to Nirvana. Can't remember. Uh, great movie. It's got the Dalai Lama. It's got all sorts of weird Indian babas in it. And it's got a scene where they dig a big pit, and this Japanese woman climbs down a ladder. They pull the ladder out. They put roofing tin over the pit. They cover it with dirt, and they leave her there for three days. And later in the movie, they come back and they sweep off the dirt and they uncover the, the roofing tin and she climbs out all happy. She obviously was in the state of Naroda for three days. You know, it's just put yourself into meditation and stay there. The other thing I can tell you, I was in Chiang Mai, Thailand for Thai New Year one year. Thai New Year is a water festival in the sense that Many years ago, the tradition developed in Thailand that at springtime, which is the New Year's, they would wash the Buddha statues and they would take some of the water and sprinkle it on the hands of the elders to salute their Buddha nature. Well, the sprinkling in modern times has gotten completely out of hand and everybody in the country is throwing buckets of water on everybody else in the country. 
It's a very participatory festival. You step out of the door of your room at your guest house and you're greeted with a bucket of water. <laughs> and you better have your own bucket so when you go downtown you can uh, defend yourself because everybody's throwing buckets of water at everybody else. They're having parades coming through and everybody's throwing buckets of water on all the people in the... I mean, it's, it's chaos. They're throwing buckets of water in the passing windows of the buses. <laughs> well, they're in the main square not right in the middle of the chaos, off to one side, they had set up a little pavilion and there was a monk sitting in meditation in the pavilion. Full lotus, his eyes were open and downcast and he had the most serene look on his face of anyone I have ever seen. It was quite inspiring to see somebody sitting next to all this chaos in meditation completely undisturbed by it. He was there that afternoon when the parade came through. He was there that night when they had the first round of the beauty pageant. He was there the next day, all day long, second round of the beauty pageant. He was there the third day. He looked a little tired, serenely tired. He was there when the biggest parade of all came through. He was gone the next morning. He had to be in the state of Naroda. There's no way anybody's going to sit there without moving for three days in the midst of all this chaos. It was, it was quite inspiring to see. Uh, it is possible to enter these states. So these are the higher jhanas. We've got about 10 minutes if there are any questions. <clears throat> so I, I've heard people say before that um, until you make stream entry, uh, the higher jhanas will generally be accessible to you. Can nah. you on that? Not a, that's not true at all. The higher jhanas are accessible to anyone who has sufficient concentration, sufficient accurate instructions, and the ability to follow those instructions. That's all it takes. Yeah. Uh, I've I've had lots of students enter the higher jhanas. I wish I could say I'd had as many attain stream entry. (laughs) Right. When the Buddha left home, he went to the Ganges River Valley and he studied with two teachers. The first teacher taught him the seventh jhana and offered him to share the leadership. And he said, no, I've got to find out about this dukkha stuff. And then he studied with another teacher and he learned the eighth jhana. And that teacher offered him the leadership of the sangha. And he said, no, I've got to find out about this dukkha stuff. Went off, practiced the austerities. That didn't work. And then he remembered an incident from his childhood when he had fallen into the first jhana. Presumably he had learned the other jhanas besides the seventh and eighth and was then able to identify this experience from his childhood as the first jhana. And he thought, is this the way to enlightenment? And he decided, yes, it was. But he was too emaciated from the austerities to practice jhanas, so he started eating regular food, regained his strength, regained his jhana practice, sat under the Bodhi tree, got enlightened. I am unsure if the jhanas in and of themselves can take you the whole way. I I haven't been that way, so I can't tell you. But my understanding would be that you do the jhanas and then do the insight practice. The sutta I would refer you to is the Upanisa Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya, Connected Discourses. Number 12, book 12, which is the book of Dependent Origination, Uh, Sutta 23, which is Transcendental Dependent Origination. It says that the knowledge of awakening depends on awakening. Awakening depends on dispassion. Dispassion depends on disenchantment. Disenchantment depends on knowing and seeing things as they are inside. Knowing and seeing things as they are depends on concentration. So we've got that insight step in there. I don't think you get from concentration to disenchantment without the insight step in the middle. Right, the the two go together. 
Yeah, you've got to do both. Some practices, yes. yes uh, it, it, it sounds like the, the fifth jhana uh, and the methodology you described to get there is similar to some, a practice that I've uh, heard in the It sounds similar, but it's not. In the fifth jhana, there's very much a sense of me observing something, and the something is this infinite space. So it's, it's not in dual. Even at the eighth jhana, there's, it's a dualistic state. You're not aware of me observing neither perception or non-perception. Okay, it's much more subtle. It's only when you come out and you reflect back that you get the sense of, you can see the duality there. But in the seventh, even in the seventh, there's me observing this vast nothing. But they're all dualistic states. But you're not the first person to make that comment that Number five's instructions sound like the instructions for uh, <clears throat> some of the non-dual stuff. Yes, I just guess. Oh, you just guess. Yeah, yeah. I, you you. You do it often enough, you begin to get a sense. If, if, say, I'm on a retreat, you know, and they're doing 45 minutes sitting, 45 minute walking, okay, right. But if I'm sitting on my own, I do have a little timer that I'll set for how long I want to count, and it it just it's a vibrating timer, and I set it on something so I can hear it. You know, it's, it doesn't, it's not loud, and so I'm counting, and I hear that, and then I stop counting, and after that, I'm just guessing. That's it. Because, you know, I mean, everyone had, had the sense of God, like, surely that for more than an hour, and also the sense of, oh, my God, the bell went so quickly. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, and sometimes I'm surprised when I get up because it was only that amount of time, and sometimes it's like, oh, no wonder I need to pee, <laughs> you know, so... Stream entry is the first of the four stages of awakening. And traditionally it is said that one has an experience without an experiencer. In other words, a very profound experience of not self. Profound enough that it uproots the first three of the fetters that bind one to the wheel of samsara. The belief that there's a self, because you just experienced there wasn't. Uh, it uproots skeptical doubt. You did what the Buddha told you to do, and you got the result he said you'd get, so that's gone. And it uproots belief in rites and rituals. You got there by doing the practice, not by lighting candles or prostrations. And then there are three more stages, again, weakening and reducing fetters until one is fully awakened. Each one happening as the result of a deeper not-self experience. Ten days is sufficient for most people to learn the jhanas. Most people who learn the jhanas. Some people, it just not happening for them, okay? They have other skills. I mean, I'm totally useless at multitasking. People that are really good multitaskers have more difficulty learning the jhanas than I do, you know? I mean, you got other skills. All right, so, but ten days, you can learn it. And you can learn it well enough to take home if you're, if you're diligent at it. It might take you 
three 10-day retreats to learn all eight jhanas and have skill enough that you can take, say, four of them home on a somewhat regular basis. <clears throat> you might not be hitting the jhanas every day that you sit down for your 45 minutes, but at least you're taking out the garbage. Your daily practice is necessary to take out the garbage. If you go on a 10-day retreat and you don't have a daily practice, you spend 10 days taking out the garbage. If you go on retreat and you've just been awful, but you've been on the cushion every day for 45 minutes and it's been terribly distracted, after four days, things settle down, the garbage is all gone, and you start learning jhanas. So, you will gain some insights at home, and you will definitely get the garbage taken out. It's also like lifting weights. I mean, what is the point of lifting weights? I mean, you just put them back on the rack, they're right where they started, right? It's a mind training exercise. So just sitting there and bringing your attention back again and again is strengthening your mind. So those, that's my answers to the question. And no, we're not screwed. It may not be possible for a lay person doing 10 day retreat a year and 45 minutes, six days a week to get fully enlightened. But that sort of practice will enhance your life. That I can guarantee you. You will gain enough insight that you will stop doing some of the stupid stuff you used to do and do some of the stuff that's actually more helpful. Think of enlightenment like the North Star. It's how you orient yourself. It's not a destination. If you get there, great. Please come see me and tell me how you did it. All right, we got one minute. I'm going to say thank you very much. They say that teaching the Dhamma, sharing the Dhamma, is a great way to make merit. And I appreciate this opportunity. And may the merit of our practice today be for the benefit of all beings everywhere.